our final topic, and we're going to be looking at oligopolies. And the reason for this, I don't want this, and absolutely, this will not be a lecture or series of lectures on industrial economics. I'm not interested about market structure per se. The whole point about looking at oligopolies is to pull together all the game theoretic principles that we've seen in the past. Ideas of static games, dynamic games, the idea of a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium or a Nash equilibrium. All these game theoretic concepts that we've looked at up until this point and apply them to answering certain questions and we're going to use the idea of oligopolistic markets to do just that. Now the whole point about oligopolistic markets though is that you have firms, a limited number of firms in these type of markets who compete against each other. So obviously there are strategic interactions. What <coughs> one firm does will have implications upon another firm. Other firms will have to think about what its rivals are going to do, what strategies it's going to adopt. So this explains perfectly this whole module on game theory. When we started off the module, I said the whole point about game theory is looking at those strategic interactions that take place between economic agents. That perfectly describes what will happen in an oligopolistic market. And this is just to give you that warning. If a question did come up on something like oligopolies in your exam, I'm not interested in industrial economics. What I'm interested in is you explaining game theoretic concepts, all those concepts that you already know, just the application of them. And again, I'm not particularly concerned about the algebra that we'll be going through. Okay, that's there, and you need to do a little bit of mechanics to get the correct answers. But it all needs to be explained in terms of game theory. If you exclude the game theory, you're not going to get the marks in the exam. Couch it all in terms of those game theoretic principles that we've spent the previous eight weeks doing. So, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at oligopolistic, oligopolistic markets, those type of market structures where a limited number of firms compete against each other. And specifically, we're going to look at three types of market structure. And I'm sure you would have heard these three before. The first, market types, uh, the first type of market structure that we'll look at is described by the Cornell model. Now, in the Cornell model, there are firms, and they compete against each other. That's our oligopoly. But what they do is choose the level of output that they're going to produce. So rival firms decide upon their output, knowing though that their rivals will also produce a certain amount of output. And when all firms within this market have produced their output, that is chosen their strategy, the strategy is output, collectively all these output levels, these strategies chosen by the various firms in the market determine the market price. And that is the price that all goods sell for. So that's the corner model, where firms compete against each other on quantity. Now related to the corner model, there's the Stackelberg model. And in the Stackelberg model, again, these limited number of firms compete against each other in the market in terms of the level of output they produce. And then collectively, whatever level of output all of these firms produce, that determines the market price of output. The difference, though, between Corno and Stackelberg is that in Stackelberg, the nature of the market structure is such that there's a dominant firm within the market. There's a firm who produces as a leader, and then given what it does, it assumes a certain market position, the other firms in that market then follow. So there's a leader and follower type relationship. And that is the nature of Stackelberg. And it's these two types of market structure, Corno and Stackelberg, where firms are deciding what level of output they produce. These are the two types 
of market structure of oligopoly we're going to be looking at this morning. Then, next week, to conclude this topic, then we're going to look at the type of market structure where firms compete, not in terms of quantity, but in terms of the price that they charge. And this particular type of market structure is known as Bertrand, or Bertrand competition. So those are the three types of market structure we'll look at. The two this morning, that's going to be where firms choose, their strategy is choosing over the level of output. Next week, when we look at Bertrand, what firms choose over is the price that they charge for their output. And just to reiterate what I said before, absolutely in no way is this an industrial economics module. It's the game theoretic principles and how these game theoretic principles underlie these type of market structure. That's what I want you to understand for the lectures. That's what you'll need to demonstrate to me if questions like this come up in the exam. So, <clears throat> we'll start off then with the Cornell one. Now, just to give you a few specifics. The type of game that we'll model under Cornell is going to be a single shot game. So it's not a repeated game. We've got firms in the market and what they're choosing over, their optimal strategy that they choose is the level of output. But the nature of this game is just in a single shot setting. These firms compete against each other, they choose their output levels, and that's it. That's the nature of the Corno game. So think about it then. The output levels that firms produce, we've said those are the strategies. But what do the firms get out of producing a certain level of output? Well, that's going to be determined by their profits. So you choose your output, your rival chooses a certain level of output. That collective level of output will determine the market price. And given the firm's underlying cost conditions, that will generate a certain level of profits. So, for these firms, that's what we've got here. You choose your strategy, the output level, and that will give you your outcome. Or that will give you your payoff, or level of profits. So again, I'm setting this up, but hopefully what you can see is all of these elements that are required to set up our games. We've got strategies, we've got payoffs. That's what we've got here. The strategies are output levels, the payoffs are the level of profits. Now, why is there this interaction between the two? Why do firms need to be mindful what output level they produce? Why do they need to be mindful what output level their rivals produce? because of the nature of the interaction between them. It isn't the output of one firm that determines the market price, but rather, as I've said already on a number of occasions, it's the collective output of both firms that determine profits. And why is that? Because it's the collective level of output that determines the market price. And the market price is crucial in conjunction with output to determining the level of profits. So that's what the firms need to do. They need to think, what level of output do I want to produce to achieve a certain objective? But also, what level of output is my rival going to produce? Because again, that will affect my profits. And that's the nature of that strategic interaction that takes place between the firms. That's why it's all couched in terms of game theory. So, that's what the Kono model is. Now I'm going to give you a basic, basic setup. A few more specifics to make this model that we're going to set up a bit more tractable. Now we've said it's an oligopolistic market. Well, oligopolies mean a limited number of firms competing against each other. Well, we could choose any number of firms if we really, really wanted to. But we're going to make it nice and easy, and we'll consider the situation of a duopoly where there are just two firms competing against each other. And these two firms, we'll say, are firm one and firm two. 
So we'll always use notation in what follows. The subscript 1 denotes something relating to firm 1. The subscript 2 will denote something relating to firm 2. And with that in mind, we'll say that these two firms produce exactly the same product. There is no product differentiation. There is no brand loyalty to build up. Consumers don't mind who they buy their output from. It's exactly the same product. And given this exact same project, this homogenous product, Firm 1 will produce a certain level of output Q1, and Firm 2 will produce a certain level of output Q2. And what does this mean? Well, collectively, it's how much output Firm 1 produces and how much output Firm 2 produces that will determine the total market output and will determine, will denote the total market output by that capital letter Q. And what have we said total market output determines? Well, that determines the price. And the price of the output is just a function of Q, total market output, which in itself is just the sum of the output produced by firm 1 and the output produced by firm 2. So, so far, it's all fairly straightforward. So we've mentioned quantity, the strategies that firm choose. We've mentioned the price, which in itself will then determine the profits. What we haven't done so far, though, is mentioned anything about costs. And again, we'll assume it's nice and straightforward. We'll just say costs is a function of the level of output produced. So for any firm, its costs, let's say firm I, so for firm 1, its cost is determined by the level of output it produces, Q1. For firm 2, its costs are determined by the level of output it produces, Q2. So, we've got strategies to choose, we've got prices, and we've got the costs. That's all we need now for our basic setup. So, what's the next step? Can we finish that? So, what is our next setup? <coughs> I've now given you absolutely everything that we'll need to set these games up. But what was the point in all the lectures that we've done so far in setting these games up? To find the outcome, the most plausible outcome, the most likely outcome. Well, I've set this <coughs> as a single shot game, where these two firms are choosing their level of output at the same time. So, how do you find the outcomes in these sorts of games? We use the idea of a Nash equilibrium. So, let's frame it in terms of what we've got here. Each firm then wants to choose, if you think about what a Nash equilibrium is, each firm wants to choose its optimal strategy. That is, choose an optimal level of output. But it wants to choose this level of output given its belief about what it thinks its rival is going to do. Given its belief on the level of output it expects its rival to produce. And once we've done that, when all firms have chosen an optimal strategy, given their beliefs about their rival, and this happens for both firms, what have we got? We therefore have a Nash equilibrium, where both firms are producing optimal levels of output. And if they're producing optimal levels of output, would they wish to produce, produce a different level? The simple answer is no. And hence, that's why we have a Nash equilibrium. Neither of these firms will have an incentive to deviate, produce more or less output. That accords perfectly with our notion of a Nash equilibrium. And that's what we need to find. So, up until this point, <coughs> I've set the game up. I've told you about the strategies that the firms can choose. I've told you about the outcomes or the profits or the payoffs that these firms can receive. That's their profits. Pretty much, this is exactly the same as every single game that we've arrived at until this point. There's a slight or subtle difference, though. Let's say that output levels was one unit, or two units, or three units, or a high level of output, or a low level of output. If that were the case, we could easily 
represent this game in its normal form. We could present these games in a payoff matrix, and we could then go through our tried and trusted procedure of identifying a Nash equilibrium. We say, for any given level of output of firm 2, what's the optimal response, the optimal strategy of firm 1? We could put the circle around it, and then we do map the entire game, and we say, well, where do these circles coincide? That's where both firms are choosing an optimal strategy. That is our Nash equilibrium. But what have we got here? Firms are choosing over levels of output. Levels of output are virtually infinite. So there's no way that we could represent all of these different levels of output for firm 1 and firm 2 in a matrix and make it attractive. So we're going to need something different. And that something different is something we've touched upon before. And that's a way of representing a, more dis a less discrete, a more continuous range of strategies. And that's by making use of a best response function. Now, when we looked at mixed strategies, that's what we did. And we graphically represented them. Well, if we wanted to, we could also graphically represent them here. But I'm not going to do that. We're going to define these best response functions algebraically. But exactly the same principles apply. If we find the best response function for one firm, that tells us all of the optimal strategies of that firm, given that top part there, given its belief about what the other firm is going to do. And when our best response functions coincide, that describes a Nash equilibrium, that situation where both firms are choosing optimal strategies. So that then is our basic setup. We've got the corner model, we know what we're trying to look at, and this here is the way in which we're going to identify a Nash equilibrium. So, with that in mind then, I'm now going to give you a very, very specific example. It is a specific example, and the outcomes that we get depend upon the numbers that I put in here. So what I don't want you to think is the outcomes that we get, the quantities, the strategies that we get, the Nash equilibrium that we get, will always be the same. I'm going to give you one very specific example that we're going to work through in lectures. We'll work through an alternative example in seminars. But it's the basic principle that I want you to understand. Don't think, just because I gave you this example, if it came up in an exam, you get the exact same example. It's understanding what's going on here and drawing in all of those game theoretic principles. That's the important part. Your demonstration to me in an exam that you understand it, as well as working through and getting that answer at the end. <clears throat> so, firstly, we'll say something about the price, the market price. And we said market price was related, market price P, was related to the total level of output produced by both firms in the market. Specifically, for this example, I'll say that price is determined by that relationship there, A minus Q, where A is just some exogenous constant, and Q is total market output. Now, that might seem complicated, it certainly isn't. What does that describe, though? Well, I will come back to this very, very, very quickly for you. There we go. Price equals A minus Q. What does that describe? The relationship between price and quantity. Price is related to the level of quantity produced, the total quantity produced within the market. And I've said it's A minus Q. So there you go. A is that exogenous variable there, that fixed constant. So that's our vertical intercept. And the slope of minus Q, therefore, it slopes downwards. They've got a negative relationship. Forget about all that there for the moment. Don't worry. It's just that diagram. So price is related in a negative way to quantity. And that just describes conventional downward sloping demand curve. And I've made it nice and easy. A minus Q is the equation of a straight line. So that demand curve is linear. Just downward sloping straight line. So that's all I've represented by that relationship between price and quantity. Something very, very simple like that. So, 
Whoops. That's the first aspect of the example, a very specific example that I'm going to run through. A linear relationship between price and quantity. A linear demand curve. Secondly, we'll also assume, nice and easy, that cost is equal to C times the level of output produced. So there's a constant marginal cost. And that constant marginal cost is denoted by the value C. Each unit costs exactly the same to produce. So where C here is the marginal cost of production. So again, just to make the algebra that we're going to run through subsequently nice and easy. <clears throat> so that's what we've set up. What do we now want to find? Well, we want to find these optimal strategies of the firm. Now, I've said the amount of output the firm 1 produces is Q1. I've said that the amount of output the firm 2 produces is Q2. What then is the Nash equilibrium? Well, the Nash equilibrium will be where both firms are choosing optimal strategies, optimal quantities. And I will denote these optimal quantities, optimal strategies, by the star. So whatever level of output firm 1 could produce, that is Q1. The optimal level of output that gives us the Nash equilibrium is Q1 star. The optimal level of output that firm 2 produces in the Nash equilibrium is Q2 star. So the star will denote an optimal level of output. And in a moment, I'll tell you what, how the optimal level of output is defined. So the Nash equilibrium requires both firms to be producing an optimal level of output. So there you go. It's Q1 star, Q2 star. So I said that's just a little bit of notation. But bear in mind, and you'll see what I subsequently present and the notation that I present, if it's got a star, it means it's an optimal level of output. Okay. Don't forget that. So what do the firms want to do? Well, the way that I've set this up and the algebra that we'll go through, it's, it's all t totally and utterly symmetrical for the corner one. Whatever we find for firm one, we just turn it around and change Q1 for Q2, and that will give us exactly the same for firm two. So that is what firm one wants to do. It want, and this is just a notation to describe what we're trying to do here. It wants to choose its optimal strategy. And remember, its optimal strategy is Q1. It wants to choose Q1 such that it, it maximizes something, that it maximizes its payoff. Now, for these firms, what is the payoff? Well, the payoff is the profits. So both firms, and this is the example of firm one, that would be then the example of firm two, but I'll come on to that in a moment. Firm 1 wants to choose the level of output that's optimal. Wants to choose the level of output, Q1, whatever that happens to be, such that it maximizes its profits. But it will want to do that subject to what? Subject to the consideration that it will produce a certain level of output, but its rival firm 2 will also produce a certain level of output. <coughs> And this level of output that its rival produces will affect its profits because that determines total market output. And as total market output increases, what happens to price? It falls. And therefore, you'd expect profits to also fall. So that's what firm one needs to take account of. It wants to choose its level of output Q1 such that its rival produces a level of output Q2. But why have I put a star? Next to that Q2. Anyone want to hazard a guess? I'm going to wait for me to give you the answer. That'd be preferable. Q2 star. Think about what happened when we looked, when we defined a Nash equilibrium. And we said, how does this concept arise? Each firm will want to choose an optimal strategy, given its belief of its rival. But what's the most plausible belief of what your rival will do. Well, if your rival is also rational, if your rival also wants to maximise profits, that belief is the most plausible level of output 
that your rival will produce is an optimal level of output. Hence, that's the optimal level of output produced by firm two. So the way that we would describe that is firm one is choosing its level of output, Q1, such that it maximizes profits, pi one, given that its rival, firm two, is producing an optimal level of output. So again, it might look very simple, but it's the interpretation that I want you to put on it that's all important. So, that was in words. That's what firm one wants to do, wants to maximize profits. And I'll come on, I'll describe that in a very, very brief moment. What does firm two want to do? Pretty much exactly the same. Firm two wants to produce a level of output, Q2, such that it maximizes its profits, pi two, but it will choose its level of output under the consideration that its rival firm one is producing an optimal level of output, Q1 star. So you can see, all we're doing is changing one for the other, Q1 for Q2, but the interpretation, apart from that, is all exactly the same. There's no real difference between that equation there and that equation. What though about the right hand side? What have we got? Here? Well, let's think about it. Profits. That's what a firm is looking to maximize. And what are profits? Profits are the difference between revenue and costs. Total revenue minus total cost is profit. So, so what have we got on these slides? Profits, let's say this for example is profits for firm one. Total revenue minus total costs. But what's total <coughs> revenue for any firm? It's price times quantity. It's the price that firm one receives for its output. Remember, this is going to be a constant price across the entire market. These firms don't receive different prices for the quantities that they produce. They receive exactly the same market price, P. And we, we know what that is. That's determined by a downward sloping demand curve. So price times quantity is the total revenue for firm one. The market price it receives for the amount of output it produces, Q1. That's total revenue. And what is total cost? Well, that was just marginal cost times the number of units produced. So total cost. So difference between total revenue and total cost is the profits for firm one. But remember, P here, we said it's equal to A minus Q, capital Q, total market output. And so that is just the sum of Q1 plus Q2, the output that firm one actually produces itself, plus the output that its rival firm two produces. So don't worry about what follows from there onwards. It's just that top part I want you to look at. So there you go. Profits, total revenue minus total cost. Just need to remember that price there is given by our linear demand curve. A minus Q1 plus Q2. Well, with that in mind then. With that in mind, what do we find here? That's A minus Q1 plus Q2. That's quantity. Total market output. So that bit in the square brackets was price times quantity Q1. That's total revenue. Minus total cost. So that's what we've got. That is what firm one wants to choose. A certain level of output such that the difference between Q between total revenue, that first expression there, and total cost at the end is at its maximum. And likewise, firm two wants to do exactly the same. Choose a level of output such that the difference between total revenue and total cost is at its maximum. It's as simple as that. So, how do we do that? Well, we need to find first order conditions. Simple, simple bit of 
Simple, simple bit of differentiation. So, so that is the answer that we will arrive at. How do we get there? Well, okay, we'll do it just for firm one. And I'll let you work it out yourselves for firm two, but it's totally symmetric. So, profits for firm one, pi one equals total revenue minus total cost. That's what we put on the previous slide. That's what we've got on that expression there. So that then is exactly the same. It's just that expression there. Price times quantity is total revenue minus marginal cost times quantity which is total cost. Now there is absolutely no right or wrong way to work through the algebra on this. All I've done, I've just worked through it in the most simplest way. I've not tried to make any shortcuts, just to see every single term that's there. And do it nice and easy. Don't miss any steps such that if you need to do it for yourselves, you won't make a mistake. So, the easiest way you'll probably find to work this out, rather than use anything like the product rule or the chain rule, is just take all of this and expand all of these terms out. Because what we're looking to do is differentiate that. We're trying to find the first order condition. We're trying to find the level of Q1 that maximizes profits. Well, what we've described with this expression here, that's profits. That will be the firm's profits function. And as quantity changes, profits will change. So we need to find the level of quantity that maximizes profits. And how do we do that? We differentiate it. We find the maximum, the peak of the profit function. So if you differentiate it, remember all the maths that you might have done up until this point, if you differentiate a function and set it equal to zero, that will show you your local maximum. And that's all we're doing here. Of all the levels of quantity that we could choose, which one of them maximizes profits? We find the first order condition. So that there is our expression for profits. All I've done here in the next row is just expand it out. So we've now got individual terms to worry about as opposed to anything complicated on products. So we've got A times Q1 is AQ1 minus Q1 times Q1 is minus Q1 squared minus Q1 times Q2 and then minus C times Q1. So that is just a simplified version of that. Just one, two, three, four separate terms involving values of Q1 and Q2. And then what we need to do is find the first order condition of that. Hence, we differentiate that with respect to Q1 and set it equal to zero. What value of Q1 maximizes that? What value of Q1 maximizes profits? So we just differentiate each one of those separate terms. And that's easier to do rather than worrying about something more complicated than that. So for example, if we differentiate AQ1 with respect to Q1, it gives us A. If you differentiate minus Q1 squared with, with respect to Q1, it gives you minus 2Q1. That term there, minus Q1 times Q2, Differentiate that with respect to Q1 gives you just minus Q2. And the last term, minus CQ1, if you differentiate that with respect to Q1, you get minus C. And so the first order condition, that is profits are maximized when that first differential there is set equal to zero. So when minus, so when A minus 2Q1 minus Q2 or Q2 star more correctly, minus C equals zero. And just then it's just a simple, simple bit of algebra. We want to find the value of Q1. That's what we're looking to find. What value of Q1, what output should firm one produce such that it maximizes its profits? It chooses its strategy to give it the highest possible payoff. That's the interpretation. There's a tiny little bit of algebra here, 
a tiny little bit of differentiation, but it's the principle behind it. The firm's choosing an optimal strategy to give it its highest payoff. That's all I've done there. So that, when we arrange it, and that gives us that expression there. Q1 equals A minus Q2 star minus C all over 2. And what is that? Well, think about it. Again, don't worry about anything that comes after that. That there is what? Think about the interpretation. That is the level of output firm 1 should produce such that it maximises its profits on its belief that its rival will produce a level of output Q2 star. And what is Q2 star? That's the optimal level of output that firm 2 produces. So there you go. That describes what? That describes the best response function. That describes the optimal level of output for one can produce such that it maximises its profits. And hopefully you've now all written that down. And what did we find here? That was our first, first order condition. We differentiated it with respect to Q1. We set it equal to zero. We arranged them. And we got that. That for firm one. And if we did exactly the same for firm two, we would get that. All you do is switch out the Q1s and the Q2s. You could work through it, and it would give you exactly the same. So that is the best response function for firm one. It tells us optimal strategy firm one should choose. That is the best response function firm two. It tells us the optimal strategy that firm two should choose. So, is that then the Nash equilibrium? Is the Nash equilibrium Q1 equals that and Q2 equals that? Is that what it is? You think it is that? Remember what we said on one of the early slides. We said the Nash equilibrium is where both firms produce an optimal level of output. Firm 1 is producing Q1 star. Firm 2 is producing Q2 star. Does that describe an optimal level of output? It describes the best response function, but it doesn't describe a single level of output. In exactly the same way, that describes the best response function for firm 2, but it doesn't describe, denote a single optimal level of output. So that is not our best response function. Though that is not our Nash equilibrium. What we need to do is substitute one into the other. If we get that Q1 there, look at that Q2. Now, what level of output will firm one produce? It will produce that level of output given that it expects its rival to produce an optimal level of output, Q2. But what level of output is that? How does firm 2 determine what strategy to choose? It's given by that there. So what you would do, simple bit of algebra, you take that expression there for Q2 and substitute it back into there. And just work it through. Now, what I'll do... Oops. What I'll do to show you how we do that. So, that's then the next part on our handle. So we said Q1 was equal to A minus Q2 star minus C all over 2. That there was the best response function for firm 1. Well, that Q2 star, we substitute the best response function firm 2 back into it. And as you saw from the previous slide, the best response function for firm 2, its optimal level of output Q2, is A minus Q1 minus C all over 2. That's what we've got there. That expression there. Substitute that back into there. 
substitute that back into it. And that means Q1 is equal to that. And the, the trick involved in solving that equilibrium, all it boils down to is a little bit of algebra. Nothing more difficult than that. So, just to go through a very, very long-winded way so you know how this is generated. You'll find that the simplest way and the foolproof way, such that you won't make mistakes in this, is just deal with individual terms. So let's think, what have we got here? We've got Q1 equals A over 2. A over 2 there. Minus A over 2 over 2. Well, minus A over 2 over 2 is minus A over a quarter. Then we have minus times a minus, which is a plus. Q1 over 2 over 2. So minus times a minus is a plus. Q1 over 2 over 2 is over 4, over a quarter. And we've got a minus times a minus, which is a plus. C over 2 over 2. Minus plus C over 4. And lastly, at the end, minus C over 2. Minus a C over 2. So that expression there, that more complicated looking expression there, is just a collection of those terms in A, C, and Q1. So think about it. What we've got here? We've got A over 2, which is half A, minus a quarter A. What's a half A minus a quarter A? Sure, that's not going to tax you. What's half A minus a quarter A? It's a... Thank you, Zach. It's a quarter A. We've got Q1 over 4, a quarter Q1. And we've got plus a quarter minus a half. Plus a quarter minus a half gives you minus, minus a quarter C. And so there, we take that. There you go. Let's simplify it to that. So we've got... Q1 equals A over 4 plus Q1 over 4 minus C over 4. And then what do we do here? Well, we multiply. What am I doing here? Okay, what we've got is Q1 on that side and a quarter Q1 on that side. So we've taken a quarter Q1 off both sides. That term drops out. One whole unit in Q1 minus a quarter of a unit in Q1 is three quarters Q1. And equals A over 4 minus C over 4. Multiply both sides by 4. So that gives you 3Q1 equals A minus C. And then divide both sides by 3Q1 equals A over C minus 3. That is the optimal level of output that firm 1 should produce. Its optimal level of output, given that its rival will also produce an optimal level of output, as given by its best response function. So, that's the level of output of firm 1. And if you wanted to, we could do exactly the same for firm 2. But what would we do for firm 2? We would take its best response function and substitute in the value of Q1. We would take the best response of function of firm 2, which is Q2 equals A minus Q1 star minus C over 2, and substitute the best response function for firm 1 back into that, and solve it in exactly the same way. <coughs> And what would that lead to? That would lead to Q2 equals A minus C over 3. The way that we set this up is totally symmetrical. Whatever we find for firm 1, we're going to find exactly the same for firm 2. They've got the same demand curve, they've got the same cost conditions. Hence, <coughs> it's symmetrical. And therefore, that would then be the optimal level of output for That would then be the optimal level of output for firm 2. And so that would be our Nash equilibrium, where both firms are producing the level of output A minus C all over 3. So of all the output levels that they could produce, that is a Nash equilibrium. If either firm produces a different level of output, what does it mean? 
it means it's not producing an optimal level of output given what its rival is doing. And if that's the case, what does it have? An incentive to deviate. An incentive to produce a different level of output. And so, there you go, that is our Nash equilibrium outcome. Now, very quickly then, I'll just conclude what it means for this market then. So that's the, that's the, let's say the most important part. That's what the Nash equilibrium is, and that's how we arrive at the Nash equilibrium. But a sundry considerations, what we could do is identify what's the total market output, what's the price, what are the profits that the firms earn in this market. This is just a little bit of fullness, it's just a small, small amount of algebra. And again, it's why this is important, because it helps us compare outcomes at a later stage and make an intuitive comparison between Corno and Stackelberg. And that's going to do that right at the end of next lecture. But what does that mean for total market output? Well, if each firm produces A minus C over 3, one-third A minus C, the total market will produce twice that. Firm 1 will produce that, firm 2 will produce that. So total market output is two-thirds A minus C. Given that then, what was price equal to? Remember we said price was equal to A minus Q, total market output. Well... We've said price is A minus, total market output is two-thirds A minus C. That's what we've got there. And that will equal A over A plus 2C over 3. Why is that? Well, if you think about, I won't show you on the handout how we'd work that, but look at the terms we've got here and do exactly the same. Just deal in individual terms. We've got A minus two-thirds A plus two-thirds C. If we expand that out, that's what we get. A minus two-thirds A is what? A minus two-thirds A gives us one-third A. That's A over three. Plus, minus times a minus is a plus, two-thirds C. Plus two-thirds C. Simplify it. Price is, that expression there, is equal to A plus two C all over 3. So that is the market price. So we found the individual quantities, the Nash equilibrium quantities. From that, we've got the total market output, and by extension, we've got the market price. The only thing we now need to show then are the profits. And the profits for each firm are equal to the quantity squared. And why is that? Well, how do we define profits? The simplest way to do it in this way that I've set it up is to think about profit per unit. And then you multiply that by the total number of units produced. So what's profit per unit? Profit per unit is the price charged, the market price per unit, less the marginal cost. So P star minus C is the profit per unit. Multiply that by the number of units produced. So for firm one, price per unit minus its marginal cost per unit, all multiplied by the number of units of output it produces. So we said P on the previous slide was A plus 2C over 3 minus C, which is just C. So A minus 2C minus C, all that multiplied by Q. Well, what does that expression there equal to? Again, you could, if you wanted to, I'll, I'll let you do that one step for yourself. What I will do on Blackboard later, all of these notes there, I'll put all of those there for you. You can download them and see that step of the algebra. Just I've rolled one slightly on the end of this lecture. But that P minus C, you work through the algebra, that actually equals A minus C over 3. And what was that? A minus C over 3. That was the level of output that these firms produced in corner. So, that expression there is equal to quantity <coughs> of any firm multiplied by the quantity of any firm. Quantity times quantity is the quantity squared. 
and that is the profit for the, each firm in corner. So now we've set the model up, we found the national equilibrium, we found the market price, we found the profits. So we've already done corner. We looked at what happens when these firms compete against each other in terms of the quantity they produce, but in a static game. When these firms produce their output, they choose their strategy at the same time. What we're now going to do is look at the Stackelberg one. And the difference between Corno and Stackelberg, even though these firms are still producing a homogenous product, they're still choosing the level of output as their strategy. The difference between Corno and Stackelberg is that Stackelberg is not a static game where firms choose their output at the same time, but rather it's a sequential game where there is a leader and a follower. Indeed, this type of game, Stackelberg, is also often called a leader follower game. The dominant firm in the market produces its level of output first of all. Then, given the level of output that it produces, the follower observes that. And contingent upon what the leader does, then the follower responds and produces his, its own level of output. But again, what both firms want to do, though, is produce optimal levels of output. So, that's Stackelberg. And again, what I want you to do is think about the game theoretic principles. It's not just the algebra that we go through. That's just a vehicle for you to describe, to bring in all of these game theoretic concepts. All of your intuition about what are we doing and why are we going through these steps and why do we get the outcomes that we get. It's the game theory that's the important part. So what we'll do is to make things nice and simple, we'll assume exactly the same sort of market and cost conditions that we did previously with corner, i.e. there's that constant marginal cost. The demand curve is a linear demand curve in exactly, exactly the same way. So the algebra, in that sense, is not going to change. So, what we'll do then is analyse this. Well, we said it's a dynamic game where firms take it in turns to move. But we're only going to look at a two-stage version where the leader produces its output. The follower responds and produces its output and then the game ends. And then the firms receive their payoffs. The firms receive their profits. So, what we'll say is that firm one is the leader and it chooses its level of output first. And then the follower is firm two. So in terms of our notation, that's what you need to remember. Firm one is the dominant firm in the market. It's the firm that moves first. It's the leader. And given what it chooses to do, given the optimal level of output it produces, that's what it wants to do, given the optimal level of output it produces, this is observed by the leader, by the follower, I should say, firm two, who then produces its own optimal level of output. So, very, very simple payoffs at the end of this two-stage two -stage game, the profits of the firm. Now, if you think about the way that we set this up, is it any different to any other game, that we've, any other dynamic game that we've seen? Simple answer is no. We've got the firms, we've got the strategies, we know the order in which these firms move, and we know their payoffs, and their payoffs are their profits. And unlike what we saw in the previous topic, when we looked at Bayesian games, when we looked at these games of incomplete information, here, there are no hidden moves. There is no incomplete information. Don't confuse these two topics up together. This is a game of perfect information. And so whatever output level firm one produces, that is perfectly observed by its rival firm two. And then there is no ambiguity over what these payoffs and profits are when the game ends. So, that's the game that we've set up. How do we solve games such as this then? Well, in these dynamic games, these finite horizon games that we've seen before, and we represented them previously in extensive form, 
How did we find the most plausible outcome, the most likely outcome? We used that process of backwards induction to identify a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. The exact same principle that we're going to do here. But again, as we saw with the Cornell model, we can't represent these games graphically. The potential strategies is on a virtually infinite continuum. We couldn't represent all of these in our game trees and then go to the end, find the optimal strategies and work backwards. It isn't going to work like that. We need something else. And that something else is just a small amount of algebra. So in the same way as we use a small amount of algebra for Cornell, we're just going to use a small amount of algebra here for Snapple. But think about what you're doing. It's a dynamic game. How do we solve dynamic games? By the process of backwards induction. You go right to the end of the game, find the optimal strategies in those final round of subgames, take those as given, and then move backwards towards the beginning of the game. Which is why it's important you remember how this game is set up. Firm 1 moves first, produces output, and then Firm 2 produces its output. So, how would we solve this game by backwards induction? Do we start off with Firm 1, the firm that moves first? No. We start off with Firm 2, the firm that makes the final move. So, that's what we need to do. We need to start off with Firm 2. This is the end of the game. Firm 2 wants to choose an optimal level of output, given that it's observed what Firm 1 has already produced. So, that's what we've got. Is that expression, does it look exactly, exactly the same as what we found under Corner? What Firm 1, sorry, what Firm 2 wants to do is choose a level of Q2, choose its output level, such that it maximizes its profits, Q2, given that its rival is producing a certain level of output, Q1. And what are profits equal to? Profits are the difference between price, which is that expression there in square brackets, price times quantity is total revenue, less total cost, marginal cost times quantity. So. Simple question, just to throw that at me. Is that the exact same expression that I gave you previously? Does it look like it? Yep. Everyone happy that's the... There's, n there's nothing new here. That's the exact same expression. What is it? There's a subtle difference. The, the uh, stars. Exactly. When we did call code, what was the idea? The idea that a firm will produce... <coughs> when they're moving in a static game, when they're choosing outputs at the same time. You produce your level of output given your expectation that your rival will produce a certain level of output. Expectation. And that expectation is it's going to be an optimal level of output. Is this the same in this dynamic game? When firm 2 makes its choice over the level of output that it produces, is it basing that level of output on an expectation? of what firm one will do. No. It's already observed the level of output that firm one produces. It's observed that level of output Q1. It's not an expectation of an optimal level of output. It's an actual level of output. So again, it's subtle differences. But if you're going to be explaining these things to me, if you want to demonstrate understanding, it's these small subtle differences that will make all the difference. So, you can see here, we've dropped that value, the star. It's Q1, not Q1 star. So, that's what Firm 1, Firm 2 wants to do. Choose a level of output such that it maximizes profits. And I won't go through the algebra, because that's what we did in the previous lecture. What do we do? We find the first order condition. It's exactly, exactly the same. Apart from the fact that we've not got a star, it is exactly exactly the same. We take the profit function, we differentiate this with respect to Q2, you set it equal to zero, 
That's what happens when you differentiate it with respect to Q2. You set it equal to zero. And that then solves for that. Now I skipped over that quickly because you have that previously. Okay? So there's no need for me to dwell on that. But it gives that expression there. And that for firm two, it's its best response function. Exactly the same as we saw under corner. With the exception that it's now not Q1 star, it's just Q1. It's an observed level of Q1. And that's it for firm two. That, in that last round of games where firm two is making its choice, choosing its optimal strategy, how much output will it produce? It will produce that much output there. It will observe what firm one produces, and then it will respond accordingly and produce that much. So this is the best response function for firm two. And that's all we need to do for the moment for firm two. Then what do we do? Process of backwards induction. We know what the last round of games to be played, the output, the strategy of firm two. We take those as given, that's that there, and then we move to the preceding round. And what's the preceding round? The preceding round is when firm one makes its choice. And this is where it's slightly different. So, firm one will know whatever level of output I produce, my rival firm two will respond in a certain way and subsequently produce a certain level of output. And the level of output that I produce the level of output that the follower subsequently produces will determine the overall level of profits. So, what does it need to do? Well, the basic principle doesn't change. It needs to produce a certain level of output, Q1, and I'll put the S on the end of Q1, just to denote that we're now talking about the Stackelberg model. So it needs to produce a level of output, Q1, such that it maximizes its profits. Knowing whatever output level it produces, its rival will respond with its own level of output. That level of output is firm two's best response function. And just to remind you, if you go back to that best response function for firm two, we'll see that it's related to Q1. So, that's what it wants to do. Firm 1 wants to choose its level of output Q1 such that it maximises its profits pi 1. And profits, again, the difference between price, which is that term in square brackets, times quantity, price times quantity, is total revenue. Less minus total costs. And total costs are marginal cost minus output produced. That part doesn't change. There's only one subtle and slight difference. Whereas previously, we said price was A minus Q, total industry output, which was Q1 plus Q2. Now, though, it's just different. Total industry output is Q1, the amount of output that firm 1 produces, plus how much output will firm 2 produce. The amount of output the firm 2 will respond by producing is given by its best response function. That's what we've got in there. It's no longer just a fixed level of Q2. It's a specific level of output of firm 2 given by its best response function. That we just defined. And that's all we need to do. Solve it now in exactly, exactly the same way. So were I to <clears throat> take then the best response function, and what was that? That was A minus Q1 minus C all over 2. So I, that term there is just substituted into then the best response function for firm 2. And then after that, it's then a simple case of algebra. Now again, I'll, I'll do this nice and slowly for you, but we could take that, that entire expression there, and what do we want to do? Find the first order condition, the level of Q1 that maximizes 
that. So if we take the first order condition, I differentiate that with respect to Q1, set it equal to zero, that gives us the optimal level of output. No different from anything you would have seen in any of your first year, second year, or indeed up until this point here. No different to what we did in this first part of the lecture. Just differentiate that with respect to Q1 and set it equal to zero. If you did do that, I'll show you what you'll get in a moment. But just to just to run you through what you might do. So that is what we said. Profits are A minus Q, A minus Q1 plus. For that expression there, rather than in Corno, we now substitute in the best response function, which was that part there. All that times quantity minus total cost. And again, you'll probably find that the simplest way to do this, the way that guarantees almost you won't make a mistake in the exam, is just to deal with individual terms. Just break it down to individual terms and then differentiate those. So what have we got? We've got A times Q1. That's AQ1. We've got minus Q1 times Q1 is minus Q1 squared. Then minus A over 2 times Q1. Minus A over 2Q1. Minus times a minus is a plus. Q1 times Q1 over 2. So that's plus Q1 squared over 2. So minus A of minus A over 2 times Q1. A over 2 times Q1. Minus times a minus is a plus Q1 over 2 times Q1. So that's plus Q1 squared over 2. Minus times a minus is a plus C over 2 times Q1. That's plus C over 2 times Q1. And lastly, minus C, Q1. Yeah? And then just collect these terms together. Collect all the terms in A together. Collect all the terms in Q1 together. Collect all the terms in C together. So, we've got, we've got A, Q1 there. We've got minus half A, Q1 there. So, you've got A, Q1 minus half A, Q1 gives you half AQ1. A whole unit minus a half gives you half a unit. So that's half A over 2 Q1. We've got a minus Q1 squared there. You've got half Q1 squared there. So minus 1 plus a half is minus a half. So that gives us minus a half Q1 squared. And then lastly, we've got half C Q1 minus a whole unit of CQ1. So one whole unit minus a half gives you minus a half. And you can see, obviously, I went through this last year. As it's gone through, you can see even I make mistakes. So again, obviously, I put a plus there and realized it wasn't working out, so I went back. But easy, easy mistakes to make. But, which is why, if you do it nice and slowly, collect your terms together, be careful, and in these sorts of things, probably the mistake you would make is in terms of the minus is outside. Make sure it's a minus or a plus. Do it slowly, do it methodologically, and it's straightforward. So there you go. That's what profits are equal to. So that, that nasty looking expression there, profits is equal to that much simpler looking expression there. And so what do you want to do? We want to find the first order condition of that. Differentiate that with respect to Q1 and set it equal to zero. So you go, just differentiate each of those individual terms with, with respect to Q1. So that first term, A over 2 Q1, differentiate it with respect to Q1, you get A over 2. You've got minus Q1 squared over 2, differentiate that with respect to Q1, you get minus Q1. And here, minus C over 2 Q1, differentiate that with respect to Q1, you get minus C over 2. So that would suggest that profits are maximised when A over 2 minus Q1 minus C over 2 is equal to 0. Set the first order condition equal to 0 and just work that out. And remember what we're interested in? We want to find Q1. What value of Q1 maximises profits? Now if you've worked this through in this Stackelberg and there are any expressions in Q2 in there, you know you've done it completely and utterly wrong. You're trying to find the value 
of Q1, the actual level of output. Can't have any expressions in Q2. If it is, you've set it up wrong. So Q1 equals, you can see if we arrange this, A minus C all over 2. There we go. So Q1, there is a Q1 equals A minus C over 2. And that is the optimal level of output that firm 1 is going to produce. Firm 1 knows it will produce a level of output and then its rival will respond. But what level of output does it produce? That's the level of output it produces. A minus C over 2. So what's then the next step? Well, to complete it, if we know that is the optimal level of output that the firm will produce in round 1, that we've identified by that process of backwards induction, we just now need to take that value there and substitute it back in to the best response function of firm 2. The best response function of firm 2, so just to jump that I'm not confusing anybody, just to jump to the visualizer again. We said that that Q2 equals A minus Q1 minus C over 2. That was the best response function for firm 2. When you substitute that value of firm 1's Q1, which is half A minus C, substitute that into there. So Q2 equals A minus then A minus C over 2, minus C, all of that over 2. And again, if you want me just to work through the fullness of this, what's the easiest thing to do? Again, take that expression there and just simplify it. Simplify it in terms of A's and C's. So we have Q2 equals A over 2, A over 2, minus a over 2 over 2. So it's minus A over 4. And a minus times a minus is a plus. Plus C over 2 over 2. So plus C over 2 over 2 is C over 4. And lastly, minus C over 2. So all you've got now is expressions in A and C in terms of a half over 2 and a quarter over 4. So we have half A minus a quarter A gives us a quarter A, A over 4. We've got a quarter C minus half C. A quarter minus a half is minus a quarter. So minus a C over 4. Simplify it. What does that equal? Q2 equals A minus C over 4. And that is our subgame perfect Nash equilibrium output for firm 2. We know what firm 1 produces in the first round. It was half A minus C. If it produces that optimal level of output, firm 2 will respond by producing that optimal level of output. A minus C over 4. And that is what? Is that a Nash equilibrium? Well, technically, not necessarily. That is our subgame perfect Nash equilibrium that we've identified by that process of backwards induction. But remember the ordering that we went through. Even though this is a, a leader follow game, where firm one moves first, you do not start with firm one. Process of backwards induction. Go right to the end of the game where firm two chooses in that final round of subgames. So firm two first, then feed that back in to firm one. That's what we've done here. So, that then is the Nash equilibrium, where firm 1 produces half A minus C, and firm 2 responds by producing one quarter A minus C. Now, what I want to do just to conclude this lecture is just compare these outputs. So, what have we found? We found that under Stackelberg, firm 1 produces a half A minus C, firm 2 produces a quarter 
A minus C. So what's a half and a quarter? A half and a quarter. Whoops, actually it's not that way around. Okay, we'll come to that a little bit later. What we found is for the leader, sorry, comparing, Stackelberg and Corno. In Corno, when firms don't have any market power, we said that each firm, in this case firm one, would produce one third A minus C. If this firm has market power, it's the market leader, it moves first, it produces one half A minus C. And again, a half is greater than a third. So under Stackelberg, the leader will produce more output, which in itself seems intuitive. We'd sort of, if this firm has got some sort of market power, if it's the leader, if it's got a dominant position in the market, it moves first, we would expect it to be able to exploit that market position, position and produce more output. And that's exactly what happens. The firm one, the leader, it produces more output than it would under corner. And I guess that's the first comparison I want you to remember. A half is greater than a third. So under Stackelberg, the leader produces more output. So that's the first outcome. In terms of the follower comparing Stackelberg with Cornell, we said under Stackelberg, the follower, that is firm two, will produce one quarter A minus C. Under Corno, each firm will produce one third A minus C. And which is larger? A quarter or a third? One third is larger. So under Corno, the firms produce more output than they would under Stackelberg for the follower. So again, that's the second one. The leader produces less output, sorry, whoa, the follower produces less output than under Stackelberg. So again, it's just the reverse of that situation. So again, if you're ever comparing the two and you get something different, whatever <coughs> the numbers that you put in, however you set this model up, if you get something different to that, you've obviously got it wrong. The leader must produce more output. The follower must produce less output relative to corn. So those are the individual output levels. Now, why is that the case, though? Why, in particular, does firm one produce more output in Stackelberg than the corn? That seems a little bit strange. What have we, we're trying to intuitively, trying to find out why that's the case. Is this something that we've done here that leads us towards that? Well, there is. And again, it all boils down to, for firm two, whenever you want to provide an intuitive interpretation, it all comes down to the best response function. So if I ever ask you, now explain intuitively what's going on here, why we get these outcomes. You need to come back to that bit, the best response function. In particular, this is the best response function firm two. So what happens? Under Corno, we said that we have these stars in there, that firm one produces its output on the expectation that its rival produces an optimal but fixed level of output. What do we find under Stackelberg though? Is that the case? Firm 1 doesn't produce its output on the expectation that its rival will produce a fixed level of output. Firm 1 knows this. Firm 1 knows its rival's best response function. And what does it know then will happen if it produces more output. The firm one produces more output, its rival will respond by doing what? Producing less output. There's a negative relationship between the two. So again, that's what happens. Firm one knows that it can exploit its market position, that it can increase its level of output, and its rival will respond by decreasing its level of output. So again, that all comes, that intuitive 
part there all comes from that best response function there. Under core no, you don't expect your output level to affect your rival. It's fixed. When we went through the algebra, it was fixed. It's that fixed level Q1 or Q2 stop. Here though, firm one knows that relationship. Whatever output it produces, it will expect its rival to reduce its output in response. So what does this mean then? Well, it means that if you compare these two types of market structure, Corno versus Stackelberg, the price, as firm one increases its output, what will happen? Price falls. More output is produced, market output increases, price will fall. That's obvious. That's our downward sloping demand curve. But think about it. The thoughts of firm one. It knows if it expands output, it will cause price to drop. But under Stackelberg, for any given increase in output, price will drop less quickly. And why is that? Because whatever firm one increases its output by will be mitigated, will be offset by firm two producing a lower level of output. Under Corno, firm two wouldn't drop its output level. It would produce exactly the same. Under Stackelberg, however much firm one increases output by, firm two reduces it by some amount. So the total increase in market output is less. So prices are going to adjust more slowly in Stackelberg. So what does this mean? Well, think about it. These firms are interested in their profits. And profits will be determined by a given market price. And a given market price will be determined by an overall level of output within the market. Well, given what I've just described here, what does Firm 1 know? Firm 1 knows that any level of output that will determine a market price, it can produce more of the output. Because whatever it produces, its rival responds, as we've said, by dropping its own output level. So for any given output level, the Stackelberg leader can capture more of that output. And hence, that's exactly, exactly what it does. That's why we get this imbalance between what's produced by firm one, and we get this imbalance between what's produced by firm two under Stackelberg. And that's why we get this imbalance between what happens in Stackelberg and what happens in Cornell. It all boils down, ooh, it all boils down to, sorry, why didn't someone tell me? I was saying that, and there's no visual clues for you to base this on. It all boils down to that best response function. So, that idea about Stackelberg price responsiveness. It's less under Stackelberg for any increase in quantity. So what firm one aims to do, what it can do, is for any given quantity, which sets a market price, it can capture more of the market. And that is exactly what it does. But that whole interpretation is based upon that best response function. Okay, so that's the first part. Second part, though, is what about the overall quantities? Well, we said that under Corno, the total market output was two-thirds a minus C. So each firm would produce A minus C over 3 in corner. So total output is 2 thirds A minus C. Well under Stackelberg, total market output was 1 quarter A minus C, a firm 2, and 1 half A minus C, a firm 1. A half plus a quarter is 3 quarters. So total market output under Stackelberg is 3 quarters A minus C. Total output under Corno is two thirds, um, A minus C. And which is larger? Three quarters or two thirds? Three quarters. So there you go. Under Stackelberg, more output is produced. And again, what does that mean? If you produce more output, what does that mean about the market price? That it's going to be lower. And hence, I won't work through this. It is on the sheet that I will put on Blackboard for you. But Check it for yourself, just work through some simple, simple algebra. You could calculate the market price in exactly, exactly the same way. So, 
if you calculate the market price, which is just A minus Q, so it's A minus Q for Stackelberg, which is 3 quarters A minus C, calculate that out, and that's A plus 3C over 4. That's got to be less than the price that we've already defined in Corno, which is A plus 2C over 3, because market output is greater. And we've assumed the exact same demand curve. So under Stackelberg, total output is greater, and hence market output is less. And then just to conclude, just to conclude, what does this mean about profits? Well, the profits, again, we could work it through the firm one under Stackelberg. Profits per unit, remember, P minus C all multiplied by total output. Again, rather than going through any more algebra, I'm pretty sure you're pig sick of it for this morning. It is on that sheet there. I'll just let you work that out for yourselves. But that is the outcome that you would get. The Stackelberg leader would get profits of A minus C or squared over it. The Stackelberg follower, profits for firm two, would get profits of A minus C or squared over 16. Again, look at these outcomes. What principle have we identified here? We've identified that principle of a first mover advantage. We've set this market structure up such that firm one moves first. Firm one produces more output. What would you expect firm one to be able to do? In some way, exploit that advantage. It produces more output. But if it produces more output, what does that mean in terms of profits? It means that its profits, in this sense, are twice as high. Rather than being over 8, over 16, it's rather over 8. So again, what has this done? It's identified that principle that we've identified in other parts of the course in these dynamic games where players take it in terms to move of a first mover advantage. And that then is the Stackelberg model. And just to reiterate what I have said before, yes, there's some algebra in here. If I gave you something specific in the exam, I wouldn't just want a rendition of that. You need to understand it. The outcome that you will get will depend upon how the model is set up. But it isn't, I can't stress this enough, it isn't just about getting the correct answer. It's all of the explanation that goes with it. It's all the game theoretic principles that you must explain to put all of this into context. This isn't a mathematical exercise. The math isn't really that difficult. It's just a simple, simple bit of algebra and simple differentiation. It's the game theory that explains all of this that's important.